Welcome everybody to another edition of CSE Presents Tech Tuesdays. I'm really excited. Uh, we made it through our first week. This is now our second week. My name is James Black. Uh, I'll be behind the scenes today doing most of the grunt work and uh, allowing my more than qualified professional colleague out of Calgary, Alberta, the wonderful Mr. Mark Francis. He'll be your moderator today, guiding you through this uh, the, the early part of the discussion. And uh, Mark, maybe tell us uh, what special treats we have in place today uh, with our friends uh, from over the uh, over from Israel. Well, we have uh, we also have our guest question moderator, Ronnie Yeagerman, who has worked with a lot of tech companies, and he is going to moderate the question period today. So, thank you, James, and thank you to all of you for joining us on CSC Tech Tuesdays, starting 15 minutes after market close. So we will continue to have companies in various stages from North America and abroad. Next week, gadgets with software, Vodasafe, MasterGuard, and Portable Electric. So our objective in running Tech Tuesdays is twofold. First, to help the technology companies with increasing traction to gain relevant visibility. And second, to help capital markets players by introducing interesting companies focusing on whether the technology will have commercial traction and why, and also providing new knowledge of what is happening in innovation. For you as attendees, we do ask that you share ideas and your feedback with our presenters, including leads, possibly funding after due diligence, referral of someone with a unique applicable expertise, or maybe even a potential strategic relationship. And several of these happened from last week's session. You can find their contact information in the chat board already logged in. With respect, we might all refrain from giving management advice unless we are truly experts in the company's particular field. And please don't treat them as marketing targets for services. Note our disclaimer. This presentation is for information only and is not a solicitation to make an investment in either shares or debt or to buy or sell stock. CSC and Mark Francis is session host i.e. yours truly make no representation about any of these companies. If you are interested in the investor pitch, please contact with the companies directly, connect with them directly in order to get detailed information. And this time, please note that I, Mark Francis, have a conflict. I uh, did invest in Kent Imaging. I've been a shareholder for nine years. I sure wished I could have invested, had the capital to invest in Auto Nexus when I, each of the times I've heard Caitlin's presentation. And I, I still want to invest uh, in forest devices. So lots of conflict here from your moderator today. Some housekeeping matters. You will note a red reconnect tab at the top of your screen. If you lose, lose audio, just click it and you will be reconnected. In the event that there are technical problems, we may hit the restart, in which case there's no action required by you as the system will automatically reconnect everyone. We aim to run 45 minutes, possibly a little over, the chat board may be used to ask serious questions. Please be clear as to whom your question is being addressed and don't clutter the chat board. We will try to get to your questions. Each company will have a seven minute presentation with their PowerPoint. When you see my face appear, the company has 15 seconds to wrap up. After all companies have presented, we will move to a panel discussion and with Q&A. Today we have as presenters, all founders or co-founders, Matt Kessinger of Pittsburgh, CEO of Forest Devices, nominated by Valhalla Angels, Don Chapman of Calgary, Executive Chair of Kent Imaging, nominated by Chris Wolfenberg, Faskin Law, and Caitlin Cameron of the Seattle area, Chair and CEO of AutoNexus Medical Technologies, nominated by Puget Sound Venture Club, which incidentally, is tied for the longest standing angel group in North America. So for, let's start with Matt Kessinger. Matt learned firsthand how difficult it is to diagnose stroke with a clinical exam in the field while an ambulance medic in Boston, Massachusetts. During and after medical school, he became a leading researcher in pre-hospital stroke diagnosis and tried but failed to create more accurate clinical exams. So five years ago, Matt co-founded Forest Devices to create technology that could succeed where clinical exams do not. Matt? Thank you. Um, all right, so to begin, 
Um, level setting on what stroke is. We all think about stroke as uh, hemorrhage versus ischemia, but the vast majority of them are ischemic strokes, and there's really two flavors of ischemic strokes, large vessel occlusion and small vessel occlusion. The, the, the reason there are two different types is because each one of these requires a different treatment. So for large vessel occlusions, you need a surgical procedure called a thrombectomy. For small vessel occlusions, you need a clot busting drug. And these procedures and, and drugs are not available in every hospital. So in North America, about 250 comprehensive stroke centers where a large vessel occlusion can get a thrombectomy. And, it, and, and in North America, about a thousand primary stroke centers where a small vessel occlusion can get TPA. So that's where we're gonna we're focus on. We're gonna leave hemorrhages out. So uh, in, in order to give you all a sense of uh, what I used to do when I was on an ambulance and I suspected somebody of having a stroke, this is a stroke exam. Basically, I look at your eyes and ask you to follow my finger. I ask you how old you are, what the month is. I ask you to open your, your, your eyes and to open and close your hands and to hold up your arms for about 10 seconds. That's it, that's all I have. I don't have an EKG to help me with stroke. I don't have any kind of diagnostic tool on the truck. I only have a few clinical questions. And so it's not hard to imagine uh, why these exams are so often inaccurate. And the problem with inaccurate clinical exams means that I'm gonna take you, unfortunately, to the wrong hospital. And that means you're not gonna be able to get the right treatment as fast as possible. And this is really a problem in stroke because this disease is the single leading cause of permanent disability in every country in the world. It's not likely to kill you. It's far more likely to leave you permanently disabled, unable to walk, to talk, or to take care of yourself. It leaves its victims in nursing homes for the rest of their lives. The only thing that we can do is faster treatment. And so this problem really is broken down into, into two sides of the coin, what's called under triage and over triage. So in under triage, this is when you have an LVO, but I miss it. And so instead of taking you to that comprehensive stroke center for that thrombectomy treatment, I take you to the nearer hospital, one of those thousand or so in North America. There they'll diagnose you, but then you'll require a second transfer to that comprehensive center. That delays treatment by about two hours on average in urban areas. So the question I usually get is, uh, well, why don't we just take all patients to those more specialized hospitals? And, and the answer is um, not just because those hospitals would then be overcrowded, but also because it's a disservice to the, to the patients who are not having an LVO. This is where over triage is a problem. So when you have a small vessel occlusion, small vessel stroke, you need just that clot busting drug, TPA is what it's called. And if I were to just always take you to that further away hospital, it means I would be delaying treatment for a very large portion of patients, uh, an average of 45 minutes in urban areas. So this is the solution that we've been building at Forest Devices for the last five years. It's called Alpha Stroke. It has uh, two parts. So on the left, you'll see a, a durable looking device um, like an AED or, or an EKG. And then on the right, uh, you'll see a disposable single use headset. Um, this headset can be applied rapidly across all types of hair, including very difficult types of hair like dreadlocks or, or, or afros or weaves. This is how it works. Um, when an EMT or paramedic is in the field and they suspect somebody's having a stroke, they apply the device. Um, the algorithm runs and gives a binary output, likely an LVO stroke or unlikely an LVO stroke. And that binary output is all that the medic needs in order to be able to transport the patient appropriately. So we've gone through three design cycles. You can imagine you can't just start out by building the, uh, your first device for ambulances. I mean, that has to be able to drop from meters up and still work. So um, actually in 2016, we had our, our first working uh, unit that we, we ran through our first clinical trial. Um, we then ran a second device in emergency departments um, through eight uh, of those hospitals in the U.S. And now we are ready to um, uh, deploy the fully ruggedized, market-ready devices for ambulances in a, in a pivotal trial. 
So this is data from that second device uh, from the emergency department studies. Um, this will be published shortly in the coming weeks. Um, as you can see on the right from the bar graph, um, the green represents the accuracy of alpha stroke and the blue are the different uh, in clinical exams. The CSTAT one, the one right in the middle is the exam that I showed you earlier in this presentation. So in this population, alpha stroke performs uh, between 28 to, to 40% better than clinical exams. So uh, as Mark mentioned, we are initially, uh, the, the company's located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, but we are expanding to Alberta. Uh, and there's a really great reason for that. And that's uh, because Alberta Health Services came and found us. So last year, uh, Alberta Health Services uh, conducted a worldwide search for technology that is trying to solve this problem. In fact, they found us through a connection they had at Medtronic. In this map here, this inset here, you can see that there are only two comprehensive hospitals, two comprehensive stroke centers in the entire province of Alberta, and they're not gonna build more. What they need is better pre-hospital triage. So um, the, 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 the AHS team uh, evaluated 14 technologies. Four of the technologies came to Calgary late last year for live demonstrations, and they unanimously chose AlphaStroke. The clinical adoption trial has now been designed, and, and let me point out, success means that AlphaStroke outperforms the clinical exam by 5%. Going back here, we outperformed in the same patient population, but slightly different environment, emergency departments, by over 30%. All we need to do to be successful and have a great customer in Alberta Health Services is outperform the, the clinical exam by 5%. This, uh, this trial uh, will also uh, enable us to obtain regulatory clearance in uh, the US and Europe, and as, as well as uh, in, 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 in Canada, of course. This slide here is actually not mine. This slide was made by AHS, and I, I have it because it really shows the, um, the dedication and the importance that AHS has put on this study. These are all of the AHS individuals that have been assigned to this study. Stroke, just in Alberta alone, accounts for only about 5,000 hospitalizations a year, but over $400 million in cost. And that's why it's such an important aspect for AHS. And so this is my last slide, and this is our timeline here. Um, we've been around for a few years. We have uh, uh, raised a, a fair bit of money in investment and in grants. Uh, we aim to begin the study with AHS at the end of this year. Um, it'll take about 12 to 15 months, and, and then we'll be ready to launch. And I think that's my time. Thank you very much, Matt. And now we have Don Chapman. Mr. Chapman is a serial entrepreneur, having founded seven successful companies over the last 40 years and served as president of three others, all in the high tech space. Mr. Chapman has been a guest lecturer on sales and international business at many Western Canadian institutions. So Don, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mark. We're gonna talk about Kent Imaging, which is a medical device company. We design, develop, uh, manufacture and market our products from Calgary. Snapshot is the trade name that we use. It's uh, trademarked and it refers to the speed at which we can take a picture of tissue and understand the quality of oxygen and blood delivered to the tissue. We do that because oxygen, which is the O, is the most critical thing in healing wounds. And we use NIR, near infrared light, to, to perform that particular function. So the technology itself, um, blood molecules in your, in your body carry up to two, no, sorry, four atoms of oxygen. And they deliver it, of course, to your tissue. Now that's the key factor in trying to heal somebody and trying to maintain the tissue in a, in a viable state. What we do with near infrared light is it penetrates through the skin and reflects off the microvasculature underneath the dermis and reflects back up into the camera. The wavelengths we look at in slide part three here is the near infrared region. And what's 
critical about the near infrared region is the reflectance light of tissue with oxygen and without oxygen is quite significantly different and we can decompose that signal when it comes back and then turn out into a colorized image of the, of the particular tissue we're looking at red being highly oxygenated yellow being moderately and blue you're in trouble the way we do that in slide four is we take multiple images at different wavelengths of light and then we take the same pixel in each of the images and run mathematical algorithms on it to figure out how much blood and oxygen is in the tissue our history goes back to 2006 when we obtained the patent rights from the National Research Council in Winnipeg, their Institute for um, Diagnostic Imaging. We, we acquired their technology uh, completely throughout the world, and we developed in 2012 our own device. Little bit of trouble, it was a big device still, uh, a lot less expensive than the quarter million dollar devices they had, but the real goal was to try and get it to a handheld device, which we did accomplish as technology sped up and allowed us to hold the camera still during the nine images that we take. They're all taken now in microseconds rather than in half seconds. Um, in 17, we got the FDA clearance and Health Canada clearance, and we started moving the product forward. We just completed and submitted last Wednesday a new version of it to FDA to try and get the newest uh, software that we have created, which deals with the color of skin. Uh, as you can imagine, skin of, of darker colors does not reflect as much light as does skin that's very white. So we came up with algorithms to adjust for that. We're moving after that later this year, moving the data off the camera to the cloud for easy access to other institutes. We have in reimbursement codes, which are coming down the pipe. The first one comes out in January of 2021, and we're going for global expansion late in 2021 and early 22. How big is the market? Well, uh, hospitals of all types can use this particular product. And in the US, there's 6,100 hospitals have been identified that can actually use this device. And the thing that's cute about a hospital is they have many, many applications within their one house. That is, it can be used in the ER, it can be used in the operating room, it can be used in wound care, on the wards. There is multiple applications. Along with that, we have outpatient wound centers, which are also one of our key targets. And there are also, in down the road, we're looking at skilled nursing facilities and COVID has brought a lot of this to a highlight because we can take images and send them from the camera to the cloud and then to the doctor's office. So people that have been ignoring their wounds in wound care, uh, diabetic ulcers, et cetera, have stayed away from hospitals during the COVID deal that's going on. And that way their uh, wounds have got worse. And the amount of amputations has tripled in Calgary since the COVID hit. And that's because people aren't being reviewed and looked after because the hospital doesn't want them to show up. The camera we have will work very well, easily trained and work within the nursing skilled facilities and as same as the, all the other places in the wound care and in the hospitals. So an example here, this is a breast reconstruction taking place in a hospital. And to the human eye, it looks pretty pretty straightforward. There's nothing wrong. But if you look at this circle that's on here, this piece of tissue, although it just looks a little dark, it doesn't look like it's bad. But when we take a picture with the camera, it's quite blue, which means if they use that piece of tissue in the reconstruction down the road, it will necrose and die, and you'll have a big problem with the reconstruction, infection, et cetera, et cetera. So what happens is, the operator simply removes that piece of tissue, uses some other tissue that's available to him, and when he takes the picture, he's got a completely healed breast, and it will be no discomfort to the patient, and there'll be no resurgeries to try and deal with it. 
So the product as is seen here is the size of it, handheld, uh, nine inch screen on the back. It uh, gives very good detail on what people are looking at. You can store past images, so you can do comparisons to where wounds have been going, if they're getting better, smaller or not. It's accurate, it's very rapid imaging. When you click the picture, it takes about three seconds for the resultant images to be calculated and put on the screen. I can teach anyone to use it in about three or four minutes and it's out of time. I got So at this point in time, we're in a growth phase. The product sells for 41,000 Canadian, 29,000 US, and we also have subscription costs uh, if you want to buy the camera over time. Sorry, Mark, I'm done. That's it. Thank you, Don. And now we have Caitlin Cameron. Ms. Cameron is a highly accomplished senior executive with 30 years cross-industry ex expertise in the life sciences, biotechnology, technology, and IT industries. She is a specialist in building high-performing startup companies. I have watched her present on three occasions before. So, Caitlin, thank you for joining us today. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Mark. Appreciate it. So, hello, everybody. I am Caitlin Cameron, Chair and CEO of Oda Nexus Medical Technologies. I'm here to talk to you about middle ear infections. And usually when I give this presentation live, I ask for a show of hands to say, you know, who here has either had a middle ear, ear infection or has dealt with a child who has had a middle ear infection? And pretty much every hand in the room goes up. It's a measure of the ubiquity of this problem. Very nearly every child, 91%, will suffer at least one occurrence of a middle ear infection, severe enough to have to see the doctor. The vast majority of those will suffer repeat occurrences up to a dozen or more in childhood. And so we're all about reducing unneeded antibiotics in kids. We, the Odonexus has developed a breakthrough medical device for the accurate diagnosis of middle ear infections in children. And in particular is the only technology that can differentiate a viral from a bacterial infection and therefore accurately determine whether or not to prescribe an antibiotic. So we're all about reducing antibiotics in kids. In addition, we are kind of in a sweet spot where we can both dramatically improve patient outcomes and also significantly reduce the cost of care. That is a special place to be. Usually you get one or the other, rarely both. We not only have both, but we have an opportunity here to greatly reduce unneeded antibiotics in children. So middle ear infections are called otitis media. It's a massive unmet medical need. It is the number one reason for antibiotics in kids. It's the number one reason for surgery in kids. It costs us up to $15 billion a year here in the United States, which is responsible for 30 million pediatric doctor visits every single year in the US. Canada looks exactly the same, and this is a worldwide problem. So just take these numbers times the world. You can see that this is a huge opportunity and a huge problem. It's a problem that affects millions and it costs billions. And despite its cost and despite its ubiquity, clinical studies show that doctors get it wrong 50% of the time, particularly in the key differentiation of a viral versus a bacterial infection. The CDC tells us we prescribe antibiotics 85% of the time and should prescribe them just 15% of the time or so. That is a huge gap. We believe that we can reduce antibiotics for this number one reason for antibiotics in kids by 50% simply by instantly giving the pediatrician the data they need to instantly know the proper course of treatment. So the core of our technology is a self-invented, very special ultrasound transducer that provides us a recurring revenue stream. We have invented a tiny, tiny little ultrasound transducer that goes inside of this tiny little specula tip inside of the ear. You press a button, you get an ultrasound reading. Just like the tool that they use today in Otoscope, it's one tip per patient, throw it away, and so that provides a very nice recurring revenue stream for our company, fully patented technology. In addition, one of the key elements of this unique ultrasound technology is that it works through air. If you think about ultrasound, you know that when you go in for an ultrasound, they put gel on your skin, it's called gel coupling. But you know you do not want to put ultrasound gel inside of a child's ear, much less dig it back out when you're done. So we knew we had to do something very different. And what we have done is we have invented a new type of ultrasound technology that works through air. It works exactly the same as the tool used today, no pressurization, no pain, in less than two seconds, the physician is given the definitive data required for the accurate diagnosis and treatment of middle ear infections. The Novascope instantly identifies four disease states of no infection, viral infection, bacterial infection, and glue ear. It's highly accurate and it fits perfectly into the pediatrician's current routine. This is a development, our development path is a platform play. It's, a, you know, I've been talking to you about this device, which is our, our current device. And you can see the look and feel just like the tool they use today, but this is just one of the devices. This is a platform. We start with this model, which is designed specifically for 
pediatricians, everything they want, nothing they don't. Very simple, very easy to use, absolutely no training required. Then we follow with an advanced model, which will have more bells and whistles, will be a more expensive device. This is where you get into automatic population of the electronic medical record. And of course, you can take depersonalized data off of every one of these devices, throw it up into the cloud, and apply artificial intelligence. And then following that, a home use model, a world model designed for developing nations where uh, we have healthcare workers in the middle of nowhere without support. And of course, a veterinary model because it turns out dogs and cats and other critters get ear infections too. In addition, we've identified about 20 additional medical devices that can be created with this absolutely unique, fully patented technology. And you know, obviously, the, the, this additional 20 is very attractive to potential acquirers of this company. The first easy one to do would be a very quickly, we could very quickly develop a, a, a glaucoma test that is cheaper, easier, and handheld than the current glaucoma test. In addition, we've identified industrial manufacturing and food processing opportunities. Those would be out-licensing opportunities. We have a very strong intellectual patent portfolio. We have seven issued patents, one just within the last couple of weeks, three within the last couple of months. We think we're gonna end up around 30 patents total. We own all of our IP outright. In the United States, it's important to have a CPT code for reimbursement for payment to the position of the use of this device. There is an existing CPT code that can be used. In addition, we've already gone through the FDA pre-submission process, and we will be planning to go to the FDA early next year. So we already have in writing from the FDA that we are just a 510K, not class two, non-significant risk, that's the important one, and that we will not even need clinical studies for the approval of our device. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these wonderful honors and awards other than to say that what I think is happening here is that as we are getting closer to go to market, many of these investment organizations and other organizations are seeing the tremendous investment potential as well as our ability to, to great, create great change in the world and are honoring that. Twice selected is the Kritsu Angel Capital Expo in different cities, uh, uh, most valuable company, feature and review, most valuable company of the year, women corporate directors, uh, audience vote, I personally was incredibly honored to have the Puget Sound Business Journal select me as their Life Sciences Executive of the Year. Uh, just an honor to stand on the stage with the luminaries of my industry. And you may be familiar with the Red Hang Venture Capital Journal. Every year selects the top 100 startups in the nation. It's by invitation only. We've already been through the first two rounds, and we look forward to the final round coming up later this year. And I want to talk about Children's of Minnesota. We are all about the children's hospitals. Uh, this is to whom we will sell the Children's of Minnesota is one of the very few children's hospitals that also has an investment fund. And after nine months of due diligence, Children's of Minnesota made a direct equity investment in Odonexus and made a requirement of that investment be that they will be first. So this huge investment, this huge hospital and hospital system will soak up our entire first year's worth of sales. We are incredibly honored to uh, be here today. Thank you very much for your time. Six minutes and 30 seconds, Mark. <laughs> you were quick. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin, you are quick. Thank you. So we will now bring back all of our panelists for the Inquisition and also our guest moderator, Ronnie Yeagerman. Ronnie is currently the venture partner at Beyond Ventures in Tel Aviv. He is a successful entrepreneur and investment banker. Over the last decade or so, he has helped some dozen Israeli companies go public on exchanges throughout the world. In the last couple of years in Canada, he has brought AdCorp, Waterways and InnoCan Pharma to us. Uh, in addition, Ronnie doesn't just bring the company public and then abandon them, he stays with them and works with them. Ronnie, delighted to have you with us and thank you for taking over. Mark, it's an honor to be here. It's late at night here in Israel, but uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate this uh, session, I'm really honored. And healthcare has always been my sweet spot. That's what I like and I'm, I'm really passionate about it. We took in our can public on the CSC on, and just raised on exosome technology, 5.1 million. And the first company I was CEO of was a healthcare company. It was one of the leading ophthalmic companies in the world. Uh, that was about 20 years ago. So um, I'll start with the first question for all of you. Um, can you please describe your business model? I think that's very important for um, the investors. And do any of you have a disposable uh, in your business model? And maybe also go into pricing strategies. Do you have um, some, what to start? I'm starting. I'll start. Great. So the answer is yes and yes. Uh, we do in fact do have a disposable. So the business model is we make money on the device itself. We also make money on the tips. This is one tip 
throw it away. So this disposable provides a really nice recurring revenue stream for our, our system. Uh, the pricing model, this is designed to be very inexpensive because it's designed for pediatric care. Just we plan to sell for just $995. We believe we will have a um, cost of about $445. We intend to sell this company to a big medical device manufacturer. We think they, with a greater ability to drive down cost, will have the ability to take it under $200, probably closer to $120 or so. We're getting some of that noise in the background again. Uh, in addition, this tip is we sell it for about five bucks and it costs us about 92 cents. So every single time that somebody uh, uses this device, we get a payment. A busy pediatrician can pay, pay back the cost of the device in about a week, and then after that, they have a recurring revenue stream themselves. Um, was there another part of your question beyond the? No, no, fine, fine. I think it's a great answer. Come on. Thank you. So, Richard, we'll go, who's hey, well, I'll, I'll go if nobody else is going to go. <laughs> we're, we're we're very similar, and I think it's very common within the medical industry to do both things. We we sell units as a capital purchase. Uh, we have a recurring revenue from two things. One is uh, a fee per use, and it, it only kicks in if you didn't buy it as a full price capital purchase. But if you bought it as a full price capital purchase, then the other revenue stream comes from our ongoing, what we call extended maintenance and support agreements, which are yearly and are a lump sum that they pay to get coverage for updates and be able to call us for support. Um, the other stream that we have is we've just moved into uh, a fee for use basis where if they take the unit, they have a base price per month, uh, which is quite small, and then they go on a basic of, of use. Now we don't use it as, we don't charge them for picture that they take with our cameras they get charged per patient and that takes the stress off them to make sure they get the right picture every time they take it. They can take multiple pictures and the system will only bill them for the one patient that they see. Our price structure is in Canadian dollars, the unit sells, if you're buying a capital purchase, it's $41,000 and the cost to make it is just around $4,000. And uh, Three's a company, I guess. We, we also have a disposable and have the Razor Razor Blade model. So um, pricing, uh, our, our units uh, can, will be sold for under $2,000. And the uh, disposable headset uh, for about um, 150 to 200 per use. Uh, we'll be able to achieve 80% gross uh, out of the gate in the, in the, when we launch in the next 15 months. Um, the other uh, main line of revenue is from service uh, for devices as uh, such as ours. It's uh, it's common in EMS uh, that they're going to be expecting a seven to ten year life expectancy, and uh, they take the service package that goes along with it. Your microphone's turned off. There we there we are. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. I apologize. Um, my next question is, um, have you or when do you anticipate to start selling? And maybe tell us a little bit about the ways of commercializing commercializing your product. Kathleen, are you first? Sure, I might as well. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> as I mentioned briefly in the presentation, uh, we're focused on children's hospitals. So there's about 240 children's hospitals here in the United States. And it's not so much about the children's hospital as it is about the primary care practices, the pediatric clinics that are associated with each one of those hospitals. Each one has somewhere between 10 and 30 individual pediatric clinics. So when we were building these partnerships with the children's hospitals, they're pulling, they want to deploy this device throughout their system because of its ability to both, to do all three of those things, greatly reduce uh, costs, improve patient care, and it also drives revenue for the healthcare system. Um, and, and yet the insurance companies have told us that they will push the use of the device because they want access to the significant cost savings on the back end, such as the reduction of surgeries and reduction of referrals to specialists. So it's a, it's a pretty straightforward path. Children's of Minnesota, as I mentioned, made a direct equity investment. They are introducing us to the other children's hospitals. They all work together and they all support one another. They are also introducing us to a number of potential acquirers and potential business partners there in Minnesota, which is in Medical Alley. So uh, the, the sales and distribution process is quite straightforward. Um, that one healthcare system is going to purchase about 2,000 of these. And then the, the volume just goes as, as we, that, that's the high intensity users, I should also mention. 
are the pediatricians that are in those hospitals. So what we're focused on is finding those users that will use it the most because you really make your money on the tips. And that's what we want to drive is tip usage. So in the application that we have, it's split between hospitals and clinics. Uh, the clinics are usually cell phone by doctors and they don't have very much money. Uh, they need the billing codes, which we don't have until January of 21. So they're not really big purchasers and capital purchasers of equipment, but the hospitals are very different for our equipment. Um, competitive products using uh, injectable dyes and watching dyes move through the tissue cost 150 to $200,000 and the dye is very expensive. And there's side effects, nausea, and other issues that can happen for patients. So ours at the 40,000, which is US, 29,000 US, is actually a bargain to them. And they don't have a problem at uh, main, main hospitals. Those 6,100 hospitals is not a big issue for them to pay that kind of money because saving, for instance, in the example I gave, the one breast reconstruction and not having to rebuild it again later is almost worth the price of the, the entire purchase of the product. So it's very easy to do. Uh, we put the other structure in place to try and encourage people in the smaller clinics to buy it and buy it over time rather than a capital purchase. And they're not actually buying it as much as they're just paying for a service of having it. And then we're charging them for the use of the device. And ours is uh, geographically based. So uh, in Canada and Europe, where the uh, the payer is also inextricably linked to the provider, um, stroke is one of the most costly diseases there is. Earlier treatment is the only way to bring down that cost. And so AHS, for instance, will be one of our first customers. In the U.S., where the, the system sometimes tops eternity, it's actually the stroke hospitals. And, and, and in the U.S., uh, there are about um, 850 of those, uh, those stroke hospitals. Um, now, the reason why they're the customer is because their reimbursement changes if they can provide treatments to their patients. But they can only provide those treatments to the stroke patients in a very short window of time. And so it requires that they get those patients rapidly and directly. And so um, the, the, if you can provide treatment, um, your stroke hospital reimbursement will, will quadruple. And so they have a, a, a very a high incentive to, to purchase. In fact, we have uh, letters of intent uh, from hospital systems from around the U.S. Uh, with price points. Um, uh, so lots of lots of customers all over the world uh, when we hit market. Okay. Um, can you describe the uh, regulatory pathway each of you have for approval? Uh, probably start with Health Canada, then the FDA, and then possibly CE for Europe maybe CFDA for China, et cetera? Would you like me to start again? <laughs> Take it away, you're first. Take your order. <laughs> so I, I discussed very briefly, the FDA path is obviously very straightforward. Uh, we've, as I mentioned, we've already been through the pre-submission process. We know we're just a 510K. We have this in writing from the FDA, just a 510K, class two, non-significant risk. And that, of course, is the most important thing. The non-significant risk designation says that we're already shown to be safe. And that's really all the FDA cares about. And I don't care if it works. They just care that it's safe and that you can match your claims. Uh, we have support to get into Health Canada from um, Children's Hospitals in Victoria. I mean, sorry, in Vancouver. And we are working, we'll just do the CE mark at the same time that we do the FDA. So it's a pretty straightforward system. The fact that it is just, you know, a medical device completely non-invasive makes our path quite a bit easier. So we're in a, we're in a similar boat. <laughs> Uh, we've had FDA clearance since 2017 on our handheld unit and our stand-based unit. We had uh, FDA clearance in 2012. The never we we do it the other way around. To me, the market is far more attractive in the U.S. So the first system we had approved, we never gave a hoot whether it was done in Canada or not. So we never got Health Canada on that first system, but we do have it on our existing system. We've been in sales of it, exploring the sales market, check, checking things and trying things, doing distribution, trying different KOLs to see how we could promote it for the last two years. And we have hundreds of units in the field right now, and we're just growing it uh, to expand it. We did have a class one clearance in uh, Europe, 
but we decided that that wasn't really the way we should have interpreted some of the rules. And so right now we're in the progress of getting a class two clearance. Uh, we do have a class two clearance from uh, all the other places that we deal. Uh, we haven't approached Asia in that yet. Uh, that's something down the road. Uh, right now our market in the US and then potentially into Europe is huge. So we're not really chasing everything at once. Alpha stroke is similar, non-invasive, uh, class two in the in the U.S. and similar path, uh, Health Canada. Um, the AHS study uh, will uh, enable us uh, to obtain a clearance in a CE mark in Europe, Health Canada, obviously, and uh, FDA. And um, um, the pre-submission process, yeah, couldn't have, couldn't be better, couldn't be happier with that process with the FDA. Okay. Um my next question is, um, can you define your client? Who do you actually sell to? Um, Caitlin, you, you're going to start? And sure. Then, uh, okay. Absolutely. So our client uh, broadly is pediatricians or any physician that ever looks in ears, which is to say almost every physician on the planet. The tool that is used today for diagnosing a middle ear infection, let's see if I can get this into the camera, is this tool, which is Notoscope, and everybody is familiar with this, this tool. And it's just simply a visual inspection of the outside of the eardrum and attempt to guess what's going on on the other side of the eardrum. Our device is designed to look and feel really exactly just like that same tool. So no training required. If you can use this device, you can use this device. So, and we've done that because the client is a pediatrician. They don't have a lot of time. They don't want to learn a new device. They want to just pick it up and have it work. So the way we reach the pediatricians, as I mentioned previously, is we're focusing first on children's hospitals. So hospital will do the key purchase and then put them throughout their healthcare system. Uh, but I will tell you, we've done market research now with more than 200 pediatricians. 200 of them said, yes, I will buy it at that price. It is that valuable to have the, the information plus the economics of course work for them. So in our world, uh, my main sales comes from the hospitals and the particular path for that is uh, getting acceptance by the doctors that are gonna use it, typically surgeons um, and uh, podiatrists and, and vascular surgeons. And then they have to push it up to the administration to actually purchase the device. There is enough money in the surgeries and in the OR that um, we become a small part of it as far as uh, long-term uh, if they use us multiple times, but each time can save them possibly a lot of money. So there's there's never been an issue as far as hospitals buying it. It's a matter of we've been preparing ourselves for a major launch and this newest device that I mentioned in my pathway uh, that we've just submitted to FDA last Wednesday, it's got a lot of enhancements and improvements in it that uh, we thought it was big enough and significant enough that we needed to re reissue it through the FDA and um, we're looking forward to that one when it comes out and that's going to be the major launch in which we go after more of the world. Matt? So in uh, uh, Europe and Canada it is the EMS authority so Canada specifically it's uh, a single uh, purchaser in Alberta AHS all the same way in BC in Ontario there's uh, about 15 or so agencies so we have about 15 customers in that big province. Uh, and it's similar in Europe. The UK has 13. Uh, Germany, if I recall correctly, is 18. In the US, it's the EMS coordinators at the hospitals. And so that could range anywhere. That EMS coordinator could uh, take care of anywhere from between 40 to 400 ambulances. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question I have uh, for all of you is what is your uh, total addressable market? How big is your market, do you think? Uh, Caitlin? Yeah, so I get asked this question. We've actually hired some consultants to help us kind of size the market because it's a brand new thing. Nobody's ever done this before. So it's a it's a it's total green space market. The numbers that come back are so astronomical that I, I often I try not to say them because people say, yeah, right. So when you think about it, what is our target market? Our market is every single ear exam for every single child, every single day, everywhere in the world. And that is a really, really big number. They've estimated this market at more than 100 billion worldwide. Thank you, Don. Well, we've we've done some studies and we've had some outside people doing studies for us. And the thing is, is that right now we're only attacking 
two sections of the market, which is uh, plastic surgery and wound care. But the device was originally built by NRC to look after burns. Uh, we've used it in places in the U.S. hospitals for bowel resections. It's been used for open heart surgery. There's uh, numerous applications for the device. And so uh, the market that we pegged is about $4 billion for sale of product. That's worldwide, but um, you know where the, where that comes out and how big that is. The only thing you don't want to say is you need ninety percent of the market in order to be successful. So it's it's one percent of the market, and we're damn happy. <laughs> okay, uh, Matt. Yeah, we we've had uh, outside people do uh, market size the market for us as well because this is a blue ocean and, uh, and offering as well. Um, so our market is every single person who gets into an ambulance, just like now, every single person who gets in gets an EKG. One day, everybody who gets in is going to get a stroke test. So even taking a tenth of that and just saying one out of every 10 people who gets into an ambulance in the US and Europe, well over $4 billion. I like Caitlin sometimes shy away from uh, saying the upper estimates because that's, they're huge. It's just a huge opportunity. So if I may make a comment, I think all three of us are in the same boat as we're introducing brand new technology. It's not a replacement for something necessarily. It's brand new. So there is a gestation period to try and launch a new new baby. And, and that's what we're all in. But there's, so there's an adoption, there's a familiarity and everything else. And once it happens, they they go to the moon. And that's the same for all three of us, I believe. I, I really wish all of you a lot of success. Um, I have two more questions. Is um, how much? How many people do you employ in your companies, Caitlin? Yeah, so we're we're exceedingly cost efficient. We have there's just six of us. We outsource all of our product development. We also outsource all of our manufacturing. So we're the brains of the operation, and we hire people to be the hands to get things done. And that way, you know, if I'm doing my product development, I only need 10% of that engineer and 5% of that engineer and 20% of that engineer. By hiring a product house that has all of those players in it, we can be very cost effective and I can have access to talent I couldn't afford myself. So just six of us. Okay, Don. We have a few more. <laughs> <laughs> You've been around for a longer time, haven't you? Well, yeah, we have. Um, We've been very frugal and, and in the early days of our company, everybody was a contractor. We had no staff as such because like you, the rest of you, we needed a PhD in optics, but we didn't need them full time. We needed an electronics person to design some circuit boards. We didn't need them full time. Right. right now we're 13 people. We have three permanent people stationed in the US, all related to sales. And we have uh, 10 people here in Calgary. We've just hired three more this summer even during the COVID problem, we've found the money and stuff to bring some people on because people are available. And when there's a recession or a problem, that's a great time to grow a little company because you can get access to everything for a little money. Matt? We're seven. Also <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, the last question to finish this session is, um, for each of you, um, how much money was raised to date in each company? Who are the investors, um, angels, VC, etc.? Yeah, we're we're to this point entirely funded by individuals and a couple of uh, strategic investors. So huge angel backing. Um, we, were, we have a total of about 18 million grand total into the company to date prior to this round. Almost all of that is angels plus a, plus two strategic investors. The one I mentioned, Children's Minnesota and also Delta Dental, uh, whose, whose focus is separating ear infections from TMJ and from cancers in the back of the tongue and the throat, and then a couple of family offices. So we've been incredibly fortunate to have a very, very high rate of repeat infection from our uh, investment, infection, investment from our current investors, uh, which has really helped us get through to the end of this. The, the uh, and how much was invested in the company? A total of 18 million to date, prior to this round. John? So um, we were very frugal in the beginning, and uh, we lasted quite a few years on very little money. We've spent uh, about 14 million to date, and as we'd say in Calgary, this isn't my first rodeo. Uh, I had friends and fr people that I could call on that have done things with me before, and that, and just all the money was raised through friends. 
I hate when you say friends and family because they aren't really family, they're friends and they're associates from the past and that, but we're just now doing our first round uh, 5 million US and going to the US to get the money. Okay, thank you, and Matt? Five and a half US, um, just uh, under five equity and the rest in uh, grants. Okay, and that is from VCs or? Uh, um, individuals as well. Okay, all right, thank you everybody. It was a, a, really a pleasure speaking to you. I wish you a lot of success in the pathway. It's a rocky and bumpy pathway, I'm sure. <laughs> but I'm sure all of you will succeed. So thank you and thank you, Mark, for giving me the opportunity. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you guys very much, it's terrific. Mark, Mark. you're not speaking to Mark, us, Mark. Mark. You're, 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 silent. Silent. <laughs> you're still, still not talking. Mark, Mark can't you're hear not much. talking to us. <laughs> thank you for that, folks. <laughs> thank you very much, <laughs> hard to get good help. <laughs> no kidding. Really appreciate all three of you as presenters, Matt Kessinger, Forrest Devices, Don Chapman, Kent Imaging, Caitlin Cameron, Auto Nexus, and uh, all of you as listeners, thank you for attending. There is the contact information. We're going to have James come on to uh, give you a social media pitch for CSE. James. Yeah, thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks, Ronnie, and everyone else on the panel today. You did a wonderful job. We're back here next week on Tuesday uh, for our next session. So if you've already registered for this, you're just going to get reminders over and over again that you are going to be a part of Tech Tuesday. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, please, if you miss a session or you want to go back over time, we do post these on CSE TV. I've put the link up above. Um, that's our YouTube channel. And uh, really, my, my appeal to you, if you haven't subscribed to CSE TV, is that we're getting pre pretty darn close to a thousand subscribers. Once we get to that level, uh, we can actually start live streaming this on YouTube. So that's that's my dream is that we can uh, stream this on YouTube as well. So uh, go and subscribe. The link is above. Thanks again for watching. We uh, the CSC certainly appreciates your attention and your time and the energy of our panelists. Good luck to everybody in their endeavors. And uh, until next time, we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks everyone. On Tech Tuesdays. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.